Hi everybody! Welcome, thank you to the Seattle Symphony Horns for hosting this and for having me and I guess I get to kick off the presentations so this should be pretty exciting. Looks like there's a bunch of fun stuff going on. I don't know about you all but I had the odd sensation during the opening ceremonies of it being weirdly intimate since we are in each other's houses now and we're, we're joining each other from our own homes. So um, I've done a fake out here and, and you're all joining me on my campus. Um, I wanted to share a presentation today about the compositional process and specifically for performing musicians. So I've got three items really that I'm sharing about why I think composition is important and useful for musicians of any level. A bit about my own journey as a composer with some examples and finally some tips and suggestions for pursuing your own journey into composition if you're curious and interested in doing so. The first question you might ask yourself is why would I want to compose if I'm if I'm a horn player why would I be interested in, in composing and to that I might say there are various benefits you can get from even if just experimenting with composing nothing helps us learn faster than the act of creating when we have to do something and we have to make it work and happen ourselves, we learn very quickly. So we can empathize with composers, we can empathize with the process that they had to go through in creating their music. We can improve our own musical understanding of things. We can deepen and develop that understanding. And then we can also explore our own creative voice and our own musical style. Many of you know that I studied with Doug Hill at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, and he frequently encouraged his students to write etudes as well as original compositions. And he says we grow as performers all along the way by empathizing with the creators of the music that we play. Ultimately, as performers, we want to communicate with our audience. We want to increase the impact of our performances. And when you experience the composition process, you work with ideas, you make choices, you start to understand how all those little important articulation markings are, or the tempo markings or the style markings. In terms of experiencing the process, composition is a series of choices. Composers have to decide where they're going to start, what they're going to do, and as you experience making those choices, you realize some of the struggles and joys of constructing music out of nothing. You also realize that there are no foregone conclusions or ultimate quote unquote right answers. You make your own right answers by creating your own mini world within the composition. You define what the parameters are and how they fit together. And when you go through this process personally, you can recognize it more easily in other people's music. As you experience the choice making process, you develop an appreciation for specific notations. And you also realize that notation is limited. You can start to appreciate those weird markings in avant garde pieces uh, and realize just how important the specifics are or on the other side of the coin. You might write a phrase that should be played musically and feel that writing in every crescendo and decrescendo would be a bit too much and you just want to leave it up to the performer. And when you come at it from the side of composing you realize that first there was music, then there was notation, then there is music again. So composing has really improved my musicianship by taking me beyond the notation to the expression behind the notes. I realized that before the music ever met the page, it was a concept in a musician's mind. 
And starting from that perspective can help you get beyond the page more quickly when you're learning and playing music for a performance. Sometimes we're guilty of not understanding a composer's intentions and thus our performance is not terribly convincing. So through the process of making choices, you experience musical intentions and you carry this over into all of the music that you perform. A couple things about internalization. Um, a teacher or student usually looks at music externally through a analysis or historical context, but a composer looks at a musical composition inwardly. The music comes from inside and from the combination of a person's experiences, knowledge, and preferences. And this introspection lends depth to our musical understanding and can increase our depth of expression when playing music. Each of us has a different musical voice and that is a synthesis of our musical development experiences and preferences. Composing can really improve our musicianship and our understanding of the implementation of the components of music helps us recognize structure and patterns in the music we're playing. When we've had the experience of writing in sonata form, we can more easily recognize and appreciate playing a piece in sonata form or rondo form or strophic, etc. You also might realize why many compositions tend not to strictly follow their form. Composers like to be original. Sometimes something needs to get out of the box. Composition lets us explore and practice our music theory. We can set the parameters such as writing a cadenza, writing a 12 tone piece, or writing using whole tone scales or octatonic scales. We can dream up interesting chord progressions. We can think, think about how we want certain pitch areas to be important at various points in the work. Additionally, composing helps us understand our own instrument as well as other instruments. We can learn about what type of writing works best for an instrument that we don't play. We can learn what good writing is or understand what's hard or what's difficult for other instruments to do. Some composers, though, don't let idiomaticies hold them back. They write what they hear and they expect the players to find a way. And I think that a lot of challenging writing has been a driver for um, bringing up the level of skill in musicians. So if somebody writes something challenging and the players rise to the challenge. So you can consider idiomaticies or you can really push the players. Composing can also teach us about orchestration and good part writing. What do different instruments sound like together? Who should get what part? I do a lot of score studying as my replacement for never, never having had composition lessons, but the score study didn't really interest me until I was the one putting my own music together. So when I was in school and taking classes, score study it was okay, but when I became a, a composer, I realized, ooh, I really need to get into that score and check out what's going on. So when I get around to writing for full orchestra or something like harp or percussion, you can bet I'm going to be do, doing quite a bit of researching and talking to other players and, and looking at scores for those instruments. Composition really lets you explore your own creativity and something that's really neat is everyone has their own voice. No one else is going to sound like you when you're writing. You can experience your own creativity um, and the creativity of the writers and compositions can become alive instead of static. You might discover aspects of yourself that you were not aware of. You might find out who your strongest musical influences are, or you might find out if you're more harmonically, melodically, or rhythmically inclined, or you might discover that you like certain musical elements or musical styles. The fun thing about composition is that the possibilities are endless. And again, there are no wrong answers. A little bit about my journey as a composer. Didn't start out intending to be a composer, of course. 
And to, to get us started, let me just play a little snippet of a piece that I wrote in 2018. This is the third movement of my Sonata for Horn and Piano, which was commissioned by Stephen Cohen. You see a photo of him here. Play a little bit of this, you can get a flavor of some of the type of writing that I do. So you can catch the rest of that on YouTube. That's on Stephen Cohen's cruise control recording. So when I first started dabbling in composition, I was probably in high school and I was in um, a language arts class where for extra credit, we could memorize Antony's speech from Julius Caesar. But I thought, well, where's the fun in that? The best way to remember something is to put it to music. So I wrote a vocal trio for uh, me and some of my friends and they had a really tough time learning it because as you can see from this little snippet here, uh, it's not terribly legible, <laughs> but I knew how it went in my mind. And uh, unfortunately, when I took it to my choir director at the time, uh, rather than encouraging me to compose, he said, oh, there's a lot of voice leading errors in here. And I was, I was very disappointed. I thought, well, okay, I guess maybe I wasn't as great as I thought. <laughs> so that was my start into composing. Then I um, wrote a piano piece for my senior recital and then didn't really do anything with writing music in undergrad, but I, then I went to graduate school. And any of you who know Doug knows that he encourages his students to write at least a little bit. So initially I wrote some unaccompanied horn solos, some etudes, some cadenzas, some other random things. And then for my dissertation, I wrote a 20 minute composition for soprano, horn and piano, which is this to the seasons piece. And you'll see Bernard Scully in this picture here. He um, played horn for me on a recording. I sang, Vince Fu played the piano. And that was the first piece that I got published. Actually, Jeff Snedeker, I don't know if he's still here. Um, he got me introduced to Michelle Stiebelton, who accepted this at RM Williams Publishing, which has now become Wavefront Music. And from there, I gradually started to get a commission every once in a while to write. And um, now I'm up to about three commissions a year. So the pace is picking up and it's really an identity I'm starting to grow into. Um, I'm published with Veritas Musica Publishing, as well as Brass Arts, and I have maybe 10 or so pieces that are available through those companies. I've had the opportunity to collaborate with really fantastic musicians, including Bernard Scully and Stephen Cohen, uh, as well as some other people locally, such as Jason Johnston has commissioned me to write a piece for horn, trombone, and piano that he'll be premiering 
hopefully sometime soon. And a colleague from grad school, James Bolden. So it, it's continuing to grow. People are now asking me to write for instruments that aren't even horn, don't even include horn. The latest thing I wrote was a trombone octet. I'm writing a trumpet and piano thing right now. And my newest commission is a piece for contrabass trombone and piano, which should be really interesting because I don't really know what that instrument does. So I'm looking forward to writing. I usually write for chamber music, but I also am hoping to expand into larger ensemble stuff in the near future. I wanted to show you, go in depth a little bit more, a certain piece of mine that I feel is, is quite well constructed in terms of the detail work and give you an idea of kind of how I work and what some of the things are that I deal with. So this is the first movement of my quartet number one for horns. If it's number one, that means I have to do number two someday. So that's probably on the list. But as we go through the score, you'll notice the form is it's a slow introduction and then there's a fast main section. My tonality is in the beginning, I use a tone row, which uh, most people when they play it don't recognize that it's a tone row because I don't treat it as such. I immediately harmonize it using pretty standard chords. And then the main section uses mostly the minor mode and then it ends in major. In terms, oh, got excited there. In terms of motives, I have the tone row and then the main motive in the fast section is this ascending arpeggio using a dotted rhythm and then it descends using these melismatic sextuplets. Some of the games you might see me playing are the tone row is presented and then at the end of the first section it's presented in retrograde with new harmonizations. The themes in the main section are presented at different pitch levels. They change direction, they go up, they go down, they're handed around the ensemble. They're combined with the tone row from the beginning. Ooh, fancy, fancy. So just to take, <laughs> yeah, Dan Danielle says uh, she can attest that the fourth horn part is, is, it's a little tricky. There's some interesting stuff going on in there. So if we take a look at the score, here you can see the tone row at the beginning. And honestly, I didn't try a ton of different tone rows. I just came up with something pretty quick and I was like cool I'll go with that <laughs> and then the first horn gets the row while the other horns harmonize it and then there's this little middle gluing together section where the fourth horn's got a bit of melody and then the tone row comes in now it's in retrograde I bet you saw that right away and then we get into the allegro section it starts out with Yum, bump, 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 bump. This rhythm, which you'll see a lot in this particular movement. And then here's your theme. And then I play it again, but at a different pitch level. And we've got a lot of, here's the puppy again, different pitch level, just the snippet of it. This time it's going down. Now the second horn has it. These sex templates are fun. Now the first horn's got this dotted rhythm descending again, but now it's going up. And then here at C, the tone row comes back in. The second horn gets the tone row and the third horn um, accompanies it with 16th note runs, which have been present for most of the fast section. And then the retrograde first horn comes back in with the retrograde. At D, the third horn gets the tune. You know, you can see it goes up here and then it changes pitch level, changes pitch level again. And then at E, we've got this section that kind of gets excited about uh, just doing the 16th note runs. This is a little snippet of the theme. This is kind of a transition section using little snippets of the dotted rhythm. You'll see the dotted rhythm happening all over the place. 
and then everybody builds up using 16 note runs and then we come down here to oh there's a little bit of the tone row again and then this is this is fun this section right here this is the fourth horn interjecting with that little bit of glue from the first slow section so you, you might hear this again and go oh i heard that way back at the beginning that's exciting and then at g we have the melody finally in the fourth horn and now it's in major so the fourth horn gets to take it out in major and then of course a last hurrah everything gets high and exciting first horn ends up on a high c sharp and then everybody octave unisons on a, a final a to punctuate the end of the of the composition so having seen the score and walked through it a little bit i would like to play it for you and have you follow those different elements this unforgettable vacation memory it didn't actually begin here this memory
you might have recognized recognized the tone of the third horn. It was Mark Robbins on third horn, I think. That was me on first horn. So after uh, just taking a look at that and listening through it, I want to encourage you all or anyone who's, who's really curious to think about the, the idea that you can compose and your whole life you have been a sponge. You spent years studying the performance of music and the many aspects of its makeup and they've worked your way, worked their way into your subconscious and composing can be a way of exploring how much you really know about the creation of music. For the composing performer, this can be about process and not end product. You, you can let yourself be unconcerned with creating a bad piece and instead experience the learning in the process. It can be just for fun, but you also might find that you have a knack for it. So if you do want to get started and you want to try this whole composition thing, one thing that really speaks to me is a quote from Nadia Boulanger, and she said, when you are writing music of your own, write as you hear it inside and never strain to avoid the obvious. And for me, that just gives me permission to write what I hear. I frequently self-criticize and say my music isn't complex enough, my music isn't fancy enough or fast enough or wild enough, but I have to be true to myself and I can always grow. Everything I do, there's always something else I can do next time. So this time I can write what I hear and try not to be too obtuse about it. How might you get started? The first thing you might do is just improvise and take out a recorder and record your improvisation. Uh, that's how I get started. I just noodle around and try stuff out. And I do that on three different things. I'll do that on my voice, just start singing something. I'll do that on my horn or I'll do it on the piano. And when I do get into writing, I tend to write at the piano because it lets me hear possible harmonies and it lets me hear how those voices are going to interact. I write on the horn because it helps me know what sounds good and what can be played on the instrument. And I sing because that gives me the most unique and flowing melodies. I think that my sense of melody really comes from, well, one, the fact that I listened to classical music when I was in the womb. But I think also I was a singer at a very young age and singing is necessarily melodic. You can also ruminate and observe. So listen to sounds around you, see sights around you. Just let it mull over in your mind. And you can also do your research. And this is a big part of writing music is actually researching. You can read about how other composers have gone about uh, writing music. One of the big things that I do is I study a lot of scores I don't get crazy in depth in my study, but I'll be like, I wonder how a composer decided they were gonna do this accompanimental figure. So I look at a lot of piano writing from other composers because I, I always wanna improve my piano writing. I think right now I'm, I'm a little meh on my piano writing. So it's definitely something I, I strive to work on. Um, you could learn about a culture. You could learn about a musical style. I have had to learn about musical forms. This is kind of embarrassing, but before I became a composer, I didn't really care about musical form. And then when I did become a composer, I didn't, I just wrote some through composed stuff and didn't really think much about form. And then I realized, wait, I can use form. And it really helps coalesce things together and, and give them a sense of coherence. And it also gives you some direction. So form can be great. You can educate yourself about a topic. I wrote a piece about um, the wildebeest in, in Kenya and Tanzania, the great migration. And so I learned about that whole process and their migration patterns and what they have to go through. And that was really interesting. Another thing you can do is you can ask musicians to demonstrate their instruments. And I'm actually really excited about this. Uh, when I start writing for things that I don't know that much about, I'm definitely going to have to ask the musicians about what their instrument does. Uh, for example, this new contrabass trombone 
thing I'm going to be writing. I'm going to be getting together on over zoom with the musician and saying, Hey, what does your instrument do? I don't even know. And definitely like harp percussion kind of strings. These things kind of fascinate me, but also I'm a little afraid because I have no idea what they do. But being a composer, it's fun because you get to find out. So like I said way back in the beginning, composition is about making choices. So many choices to make and at the same time, limitations. Limitations can really set you free. If you give yourself some parameters, it's so much easier. When I first started writing, so this the dissertation piece that I did in grad school, my mindset at the beginning was it has to be the best of everything. And that was a pretty tall order. And consequently, they, I had a tough time getting started because if it had to be the best of everything, that's pretty crippling. So when I discovered that no, it can be pretty good of something, that's a little bit easier. So what is your piece going to be about? Is there a message? Is there a theme? Sometimes a commissioner will tell you what they want your piece to be about, but a lot of times they'll leave it up to you. Or when you're writing your own stuff, you have to come up with, with what it's about. Uh, you have to think about what is your theme or your style. Do you want to write this like the, the Rondo that I wrote? Is it an Afro-Cuban style? Uh, that was very different than the horn quartet piece where I ended up using uh, just a little taste of 12 tone, very different. Instrumentation, what are you going to write for? Um, are you going to write for solo horn? Or are you going to write for horn quartet? Or are you going to write for full orchestra? How long is it going to be? Is it going to have movements? Is it going to be through composed? Speaking of the form, is it going to be sonata form? Is it going to be um, a symphonic tone poem? Is it going to be an ABA form? I end up writing a lot of ABA stuff. By the way, that's a pretty nice form, nice and round. What's your time signature? Are you going to have a time signature? Is it going to change? Is it going to be mixed meter? Is it going to be asymmetric meter? What's your tonality going to be? What keys are you going to write in? Do you want to plan what your key areas are? Um, are you are you going to write major, minor? Are you going to write in a mode? Are you going to write in um, some way, something where you construct your own tonality so it's not necessarily tonal as we know? Lots and lots and lots and lots of choices. But when you start answering those questions and answering those choices, uh, it starts to take shape. And then you can start um, playing with things. If you're kind of wondering about any of these things, there's a really great resource for classical musicians. It's Jeff Agrell's Improvisation Games for Classical Musicians, where you really can explore different aspects like rhythm or melody or expression of an abstract idea might be a good way to get started is just to improvise. So when you're ready to actually start developing your material, um, I write very melodically. So for me, I develop melodic themes or motives. You might write rhythmically, maybe it's more rhythm or harmony based or something else. And then you can play with those themes and see how they can interact or contrast. So the example I showed you of my horn quartet, there was a lot of interaction and there was a lot of pulling apart and taking just a small piece and turning it upside down or putting it in a different key or augmenting it. When the tone row came back, it was twice as slow. And here's an example, this is a Bach invention number one, where you can see the initial motive is down here in the middle bar. And you can see that in the fourth measure at the beginning, it's inverted. So it's upside down. And then it's right after that, it's inverted, but down at pitch level. In the, the bar below, so system below, sorry, it's augmented. So it's spread out. There's another motive inversion in this second bar, another augmented version at a different pitch level. 
Uh, and then there's a just a little tiny snippet of the motive. That's the second half of the motive. Shows up a couple of times over here. So this is an example of the way that composers will take material that's not terribly complicated. This motive here itself, really not complicated. But look how much material you can build out of it. Pretty exciting. Uh, you can also experiment with melodic and harmonic colors. So you could try orchestrating something different ways. Don't always have to do it the same. And once you've got some stuff written, well, it obviously the process is much more elongated than, hmm, let me think about these motives and boom, I have a piece. No, that's the road's a little bit longer than that. <laughs> but when you do have something that you are happy with, um, you can modify it and you should edit it. Um, change things as your ear requires. You don't have to, you don't have to abide by your rules really rigidly. You can change things as your ear requires. You can break your own rules. Now you're in charge. A lot of times when I'll, when I write something, I'll leave it sitting for a while, maybe a week or so, and then I'll come back to it and listen to, to it again with fresh ears. And I usually hear small things I want to change. Um, you can play it, you can listen to it. One of the great things about music notation software these days is that um, you can hear it played back, which is pretty amazing. When I first wrote my dissertation piece, I, I wrote it all on the piano and I actually paid someone to put it into Sibelius because I didn't know how to use Sibelius yet. And so there, I actually didn't hear the whole thing together until I got together with my musicians and we played it through. So I'm actually kind of, that, that person is, is a distant memory because now I use notation software and I can hear everything I'm writing. I feel like there's pros and cons to both of those things. Uh, and if you want, you can seek feedback. You could go to other composers and take a lesson, or you could have someone play it through. It really is nice to hear people play things through because it sounds very different than the sounds on the notation software. They're, they're good enough to get you to hear what the notes sound like together, but in terms of timbre and musicianship, no. You're not gonna hear that until you hear real people play it. And those are my thoughts on how to get started on writing. This is your journey. You get to enjoy it. Um, thank you for your presence. I, I'll open it up for questions at this point. If anybody has any questions or comments, um, maybe you can type in the chat. Maybe I can unmute people. I don't know. Let's see. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to type in the chat? Ooh, I can. If you want to talk, you can raise your hand and I can allow you to talk. How do I work with drafts and different versions slash saving outtakes when using notation software? I write mostly by hand and the evidence is left there. That's a great question. So um, I maybe, <laughs> maybe this is a little bit uh, live and large here, but I actually just, uh, I don't really save versions while I'm, I'm, I may save like a chunk of something way over on the end and say, well, maybe I want to come back to that later, but I mostly write beginning to end and do some heavy editing as I go. Um, and then I don't really save versions, different versions of it. I, um, so uh, what I do though sometimes is because I don't wanna lose my music. And in fact, I did actually this last semester, my computer completely died, the logic board died. And so everything that was on it was gone. Uh, but fortunately I had a piece that was still pretty new in my head. So we didn't lose too much. 
uh, but I will take a take the file and I just put it up on Google Cloud. And so I do actually have a bunch of files that I have saved along the way on Google Cloud. Um, I use MuseScore right now because, again, I told you my computer died, and the reason it died is because it hated Sibelius, but it was an older version of Sibelius. Um, I used Sibelius for a very long time. So right now I'm in a middle ground where I'm thinking about Dorico, which is a notation program I just recently heard about and it looks kind of promising. So I might look into Dorico, but I have used Sibelius forever and currently am using MuseScore. Have I ever written pieces for period instruments and tips for starting to work with them? I have only written a piece for Baroque horn, and it was for Baroque horn with um, modern sensibilities, and it was it was in grad school, and it was kind of nuts. So I was just like experimenting with sounds. Like I would take the crook itself and buzz on my mouthpiece backwards through the crook, or I'd put a stopped mute on the end of the crook and and buzz through that. So that was very weird. <laughs> Oh, yes, that's right. The team that created Sibelius is the new Dorico team. So they got some good stuff going on. Yeah. If anybody here is a Dorico fan and they like it, I would be happy to talk with you. Um, tips for getting started with Baroque instruments would be to, if it's a horn, play it. Um, if you cannot play the instrument like oboe or something, listen to a lot of it, do a ton of listening. I think that's one thing I really forgot to mention is so much listening. That is one of the places where I start when I have a new piece. I just do a bunch of listening and I decide what, what kind of sound I like that other people have done. And I go, okay, I wanna do something kind of like that. And then I have a sense of where I wanna go. So if you're wanting to compose for period instruments, do a lot of listening and get a timbre in your ear. What's my favorite piece I've composed? I was trying to think about that the other day. I think the one that I go most often to is the, the Rondo from my Sonata, but I also really like the second movement, which is a slow um, melody. Yeah. Oh, we got some Q and A's here. I gotta, I gotta check those. How do I deal with confident issues when creating? It seems like a vulnerable process. Woo, that's a great, great question. I think uh, fortunately I'm oblivious enough that I just don't care. I'm gonna, I'm gonna write what I write and that, that's great. Um, but I have students who they are paralyzed by the confidence issue and specifically paralyzed by gender issues they really feel like well because i'm a woman i have to do this better than anyone in order to even get my foot in the door and so that's a little bit tricky trying to convince people you can just try it and fail miserably and especially if you're a composer no one's going to hear it <laughs> except for you unless you want want people to hear it um so I would say in terms of dealing with confidence issues, the first thing you have to do is just try it. And it may not be great at first. When was the first time with well, the very, very first time you did something, it was amazing. Best thing ever. <laughs> it doesn't happen too often. So one of the myths about composition is that people are just great at it and they didn't have to try. That's actually not true. We do have to try and there's a lot of work involved and a lot of thinking, a lot of crafts, craftspersonship. <laughs> How do you balance learning from other cultures and styles and incorporating them into your music without appropriating or disrespecting it or telling a story that's not your own? Where and how do you draw the line? That is an excellent question that has perpetually, I have asked myself that. That is a question that um, I really didn't start to ask myself until after, well, after I had written my sonata. And then um, I wrote it, I wrote the sonata in an Afro-Cuban style. 
because I'd heard lots of salsa music in grad school and I absolutely loved it. And I, I had this sound in my head when I wanted to write this piece and I, I didn't know what the sound was. And so I asked a lot of musicians and then they said, oh, what you're playing is an Afro-Cuban style. I said, oh, okay. So I went and I learned about it. And I think one of the things, or, and I, I read an article about this yesterday, appropriated, appropriating versus appreciating. And um, when you appreciate, you have a very sincere effort to research and respect and learn about a particular culture. Um, if you're appropriating, a lot of times it is uh, disrespectful and um, you're you're taking something forcefully from someone else. Uh, this is a really sticky, I feel like it's a really sticky um, topic for composers. There, historically, there have been so many composers who have just begged, borrowed, and steal from wherever they want to. And we realize now that that can be problematic. Um, so collaboration can be really great if, if there's an exchange or if um, I guess the safe thing would be to show it to people of the style that you're working with and say, are you offended by this? And to get their perspective. Um, I have asked people of color, are you offended by the Rondo? And I have not heard from anyone of color yet that they do feel offended. Um, I don't know what the right answer is there, um, but I certainly, my best intention is to use a flavor and give it my own voice in celebrating that type of style. So that's a really great question. What advice do you have for blossoming composers who want to start getting their music performed outside of their school? Like how do you start getting commissions also if Oh, you actually use Dorico. Woo, great program. Okay, so composers who want to get outside of their, their schools, a lot of it has to do with networking. And so you get to know people. And if you get to know people in things like the Northwest Horn Society, hey, uh, you'll get to know professionals who are outside of your school and you can approach them and you can show your music to them like for example uh, jeff snedeker was the person who introduced me to my first publisher and i didn't know how to get my foot in the door so it takes one introduction introduction actually it's kind of what it takes and then you start building this web this network uh, you get one piece published people hear about it they play it someone hears a performance they ask you to write another piece so it's been a slow burn but a slow ramp up like crescendo for me uh that i didn't expect it was going this direction but it's been so fantastic it's it's been great um so you get yourself introduced to or well you make yourself known in a community and then you get introduced to someone who's either a publisher or producer or something and um, get something published or recorded and then more people will hear it um, and then the people who like your music will uh, start asking you to write for them and they'll just kind of find find you <laughs> i guess is my answer to that can I talk about the publishing landscape for chamber and solo scale music for brass? Are there small publishers to know of with particularly good practices, reasons to explore big houses, self pleasures of publishing costs? Also great questions. These are great questions. Um, the publishing landscape for a chamber is a lot of people who are interested performers. So um, Michelle Stiebleton, of course, is a horn player and she got into the publishing business. Uh, Wayne Liu, who does Veritas Musica, he's a horn player and he got into the publishing business. Um, Dave Weiner is really kind of my main publisher right now and he's a horn player and repair person got into the business. So a lot of 
horn players who got interested in disseminating horn music is kind of the landscape that I'm familiar with for solo and chamber music for brass. I haven't really ever considered the big publishing houses. Maybe they've never even considered me. They probably don't know I exist. So that's okay, <laughs> because a lot of times the people who play my music are horn players and horn enthusiasts, and they find it because horn players and horn enthusiasts are publishing it. Self-publishing is a wonderful alternative. I am doing a little bit. I just have some stuff that's self-published because I haven't given it to a publisher yet. Um, the thing about self-publishing is you get all the money. If someone buys your music, you get all the money, yay. Other publishers, you usually get 10% of the money. Um, Self-publishing though, you have to do all of the work. So you, you would need a good website. You need good uh, response time in terms of when people buy your music. You need to decide if you're gonna send out uh, hard copies or just PDFs. A lot of people just do PDFs, it's, it's a lot easier. Um, you need to think about all of the marketing that's gonna go into this and having a publisher Especially, I really have had a good experience with Brass Arts with Dave Weiner. Um, he does really good marketing. He's got a good website. He goes to conferences. He takes my music with him. So I think that the Sonata has really gotten out there more than it would have if I had ever self published it. So I'm happy to give him the music. I know I make a fraction of the, the money from sales, but I, I'm not living on composing. And I'm just happy to have people play my music. I'm so excited whenever people play my music. So those are really, really terrific questions. Thank you, everybody, for, for asking. And thank you all for attending. This is great. Any last minute questions? I see we're at 2, 2.50, so that may be the, um, the little break. Get up and stretch. It's probably not fantastic to sit for seven hours. Thank you. Yeah.